hello viewers we are back now again i will start unit 4 in previous video i already covered unit 1 2 and 3 uh, you will go through the video and note down the key points then today we will go unit 4 discussion some other context of american literature okay so we have studied So we have studied unit 1, 2 and 3 already then we will go unit 4 ok some other context of American literature which I will describe bit by bit. So let's start. So what is the structure here is the objectives introduction the quaker contest or the contest absorbed the Indian contest or the contest eliminated the black contest or the contest invisible. Then the poor white contest or the contest overshadowed. Then let us sum up questions and suggested readings. Okay. Then let's go to objectives. In my introduction to this block, I had asserted that I would use the block to enlarge upon some contest of American literature other than the Puritan contest, which has still recently received inordinate attention from American studies scholars as being the only contest for the American cultural enterprise including the production of its literary test. So here in this unit we will cover the American literature okay not the Puritan contest. The other contest thus suppressed included the Quaker contest, the Indian contest, the black contest and the poor white contest which we will study in this chapter okay what are this the quaker contest the indian contest the black contest and the poor white contest all of which indispensably went into the making of the puritan self okay then introduction the quaker contest or the contest absorbed by the turbulent 1680s in the aftermath of Rep Republican experiment and before the glorious revolution, England and its empire were in the throes of numerous controversies over constitutional liberties and autocratic power. Okay, at that time, what was the condition of England? It was numerous controversies over constitutional liberties and autocratic power, which is uh, most uh, turbulent time in 1680s England time. Against this backdrop arose a set of Christians inspired by a name inspired by a man named George Fox who had turned away from every established church Catholic, Anglican and Puritan in search of the true road to God. These were the Quakers. Okay. Who is the founder? Is the name is George Fox. Okay. Here is the main key point who is the founder of Quaker contest this is the George Fox okay George Fox is the founder George Fox in your in your NET exam also it will ask question who is the founder of Quaker contest in America here it is the George Fox okay who had turned away from every established church Catholic Anglican and Puritan in search of the true road to God these were the Quakers. The Quakers believed that divine guidance was not to be found in any outward church or even the Bible, though the latter was of course central to all faith. It was to be found in the voice of conscience, which is God's voice. Okay, So God is nowhere found in, in the outward world or church or even Bible. It is the own conscience. Okay? Neither rituals nor clergy were needed okay even taking the sacraments in church was unnecessary one's whole life was instead to be a continuing baptism in the sense of resting resisting sensual evils and a continuing communion in the sense of a union with christ okay so these these are unnecessary things the sacraments of the church and one's whole life was instead to be a continuing baptism that is the biblical view in the sense of resisting sensual evils and a continuing communion in the sense of a union with Christ. The purpose of a religious gathering what the Quakers called a meeting 
was to commune jointly in silence with the indwelling spirit okay quakers called a meeting was to commune jointly in silence with the indwelling spirit if a member felt called upon to rise and speak he was to do so freely and without concern for his lack of clerical training okay here it is the clerical training is not mandatory for all members okay if a member felt called upon to rise and speak he was to do so freely and without concern for his lack of clerical training okay the quakers were distrustful of learning for they felt it led to sin of pride in self okay this uh, they were distrustful of learning for they felt it led to the sign of pride in self okay learning create pride okay these are the these are the thinking of quakers true preaching came not from a learned and arrogant ministry they believed but from within the body of the meeting in the persons of god called ministers okay so what is the meaning of true preaching according to quakers here is a question arise what is the meeting according to sorry what is the preaching according to quaker contest true preaching came not from the learned and the arrogant ministry they believed but from within the body or within the self of the meeting in the persons of god called ministers okay then the quakers insisted upon living in violet and orderly lives of thrift and frugality okay the quakers insisted upon living in violet and orderly lives of thrift and frugality every person should have a calling a committed engagement to work in this world even in jail the quakers busily set about working at crafts and skills okay so what was the what was the quakers life okay even in jail the quakers busily set about working at crafts and skills they were so busy these habits helped to make them well to do merchants leading to the wry jest that they were people with one foot in the meeting house and the other in the counting house okay they were the very good merchant okay so they were people with one foot in meeting house and the other in the counting house at a time two words they can do but through the quakers had a lot in common with the puritans the two sects held theological opinions opposed to one another okay lot in common with puritans but two sects held theological opinion opposed to one another the puritans were horrified by the quakers belief in the perfectibility of all human beings if there is evil in the world declared the quakers it lies in external institution of hierarchy power and violence not inside the human heart where puritans thought of god as supreme authority and in his image built strong institutions of government in which the magistrate was central the quakers regarded god as absolute love and in his image built a civil society without supervisory or superintending structures so here is the main point you can note down in your notebook okay puritans thought and quakers thought puritans thought of god as supreme authority in his image and built strong institution of government whereas the quaker regarded god as absolute love okay and in his image built a civil society without supervisory or superintending structures thus the quakers sought to apply the sermon on the mount in the most literal sense creating a world of equality and fraternity here and now they aided the poor and the destitute and were the first to condemn slavery they believed in complete equality between men and women women had leading roles as charismatic leaders in the quaker movement as well as between everyone in society they would not refer to anyone as miser anyone as mr okay sorry they would not refer to anyone as mr which originally meant master called the king charles instead of king charles okay so here it is the inverted comma you can see the so king charles instead of king charles okay so they would not refer to anyone as mr okay or sir sorry master okay king charles 
that is the instead of King Charles and always use the familiar form D and to instead of more formal U in interpersonal conversation. Since Herr Turner was insisted upon in 17th century European life, inferiors always took off their head covering in the presence of superiors, quackers wore theirs even in the king's presence. The quackers grew in numbers reaching perhaps 60,000 by the 1680s, but this was in the face of sheer repression. It was a common for a quaker congregation to be fined thousands of pounds for not attending Anglican services. Okay? So, it was common for a quaker congregation to be fined thousands of pounds for not attending Anglican services. Okay, so how much, uh, how much, how much would be the fine for quackers? It was a common for a quaker congregation to be fined thousands of pounds for not attending Anglican services. For quackers by the thousands to be imprisoned or to have their livelihood denied for denied them for not taking oaths. What they wanted? What do you mean by oath? Oath means promise. Okay, what they wanted? Therefore, was to find a place of refuse abroad, some place in the king's empire where they might live in peace and they hoped attract converts by the virtue and purity of their lives and religion. For years, this searching went on into the islands of the Caribbean and on the North American mainland. Okay? Then William Penn sealing the 1683 treaty under which Indians and settlers prospered in peace and mutual respect. Okay, here it is a painting. You can see William Penn ceiling in 1683 treaty. Okay, you can remember this William Penn ceiling, the 1683 treaty, that all members in peace and mutual respect. Okay, then in 1674, a group of Quakers, including the gifted William Penn, joined to buy the western half of the New Jersey as their place of settlement. Okay. In 1674, a group of Quakers, including the gifted William Penn, joined to buy the western half of the New Jersey as their place of settlement. The Quakers, including William Penn, joined to buy the western half of the New Jersey. As an oppressed minority, they were actually conscious of the need for guaranteed fundamental rights. Okay. As a as an oppressed minority, they were acutely conscious of the need for granted fundamental rights. Okay? As an oppressed minority, they were acutely conscious of the need for granted, granted fundamental rights. And the constitution that William Penn wrote for West New Jersey, the concessions and agreement was striking, strikingly liberal. Okay? So, when uh, the need for guaranteed fundamental rights and the constitution that William Penn wrote for West New Jersey, the concessions and agreement was strikingly, was strikingly liberal. It established an annually elected assembly that was fully independent of the executive. Settlers were guaranteed full due process in court, confrontation of accusers, the right to cross examination and the admission of evidence and trial by jury. There was to be neither life imprisonment nor capital punishment. Okay? There was to be neither life imprisonment nor capital punishment. Both novel provisions centuries ahead, ahead of their is. Okay? Everyone in West Jersey was also guaranteed complete religious freedom. For there would be no established state church. Okay? They continued to live in a complete religious freedom for there would be no established state church. Liberal and liberal land provisions were offered to attract settlers and within a few years hundreds of settlers mainly Quakers had arrived. All of New Jersey became a royal colony in 1702. Okay, the Quakers occupied the New Jersey. Okay, and it was a royal colony in 1702, the two hubs being merged under a unified government that was provided by a New York colony until 1738. Okay, here you can 
remember these points the quakers arrived at new jersey and become a royal colony in 1702 okay until 1738 the new york colony was a royal colony then a far grander holy experiment was set in motion in 1681 king charles ii had owed a last debt to william penn's dead father and to repay if he granted to william penn a close friend of the duke of york a huge property proprietary colony that is Spain personally owned that land and had absolute powers of government okay so as as a far grander holy experiment was set in motion in 1681 king charles ii had owed a large debt to william penn's dead father okay and to repay it granted to william penn a close friend of the duke of york duke of york a huge prop proprietary colony that is Spain personally owned the land and had absolutely powers of government Pennsylvania including what is now Delaware which had already been settled by Swedish and Dutch. Now half a century after John Winthrop had taken his company of Puritan settlers to New England to begin their attempt of building Be began their attempt at building a utopian christian society pain and the quaker set out on a similar adventure okay then pennsylvania came out pennsylvania was outstandingly prosperous from the beginning its rich farmlands attracted a constant stream of settlers who produced a bountiful supply of food to be sold abroad philadelphia was quickly settled by experienced merchants from London and from towns elsewhere in the colonies. By the mid 18th century, they had made Philadelphia the third commercial city in the British Empire after London and Bristol. Through personal religious ties, Quaker merchants had continued all over the North Atlantic commercial world from Germany to Caribbean. It was not uncommon for an intermarried network of merchants to connect Madeira, London, Barbados, Newport and Newark and then work together in assisting one another. In London itself there was a vigorous community of Kaka merchants who aided their counterparts in Philadelphia. In the same letters they sent along with denominational news reports on crops, prices and finances also. Pennsylvania's wealthy men soon interested in western lands reselling at higher prices to incoming farmers okay then what was the condition in pennsylvania according to quakers then pennsylvania's wealthy men soon invested in western lands reselling at higher prices to incoming farmers many of them sought land for the same reason that the aristocracy did in england did to provide social eminence as well as income then quaker merchants also were not long in starting to build iron foundries. Because of this, Pennsylvania has even then so here it is Pennsylvania's wealth men soon invested in western lands reselling a higher prices to incoming farmers. Many of them sought land for the same reason that the aristocracy did in England did. Already I have told this. However, though they were so like Puritans in their ways of living, if not in their religious beliefs, in one great particular they deferred, they could abide dissent. Indeed, allowing people to dissent and to believe in and practice their own different faiths in their own diverse ways was the bedrock of the Quaker's social policy. In turn, this principle would create so great a babel of creeds and sects in their colony okay so babel of creeds and sects was created in their colony according to quaker's social policy of pennsylvania that their own distinctive identity would be lost then come to the indian contest or the contest eliminated if the quakers lost their identity due to their own catholicity the indians of new england did not have much of a choice but to do so okay you will remember that indians refers to the original inhabitants of america before the arrival of the english 
and not to people of India. Okay, Indians refers to the original inhabitants of America before the arrival of English. By the 1670s, the Indians of New England were desperate. Ever since the brief Pequot War of 1637, which already I have discussed in Unit 1, Pequot War, they had kept their heads low, traded a dwindling supply of force for guns and alcohol and gems, and watched their cultures, their identity, and their territories declining. Meanwhile, the wealthy and healthy Puritans were growing rapidly in numbers from 25,000 in 1650 to 50,000 in 17, 1675. Okay, their numbers were in 25,000 in 1650 and suddenly they increased to 50,000 in 1675. Several thousand playing, praying Indians tried to emulate white ways. Okay, so here several thousand praying Indians tried to emulate white ways but a rising generation of proud younger Indians looked upon them with contempt and burned for revenge against the humiliations their people were suffering. Okay, Several thousand praying Indians were found. So, several thousand praying Indians tried to emulate white ways, but a rising generation of proud younger Indians looked upon them with contempt and burned for revenge against the humiliations their people were suffering. Metacom, the leader of Wampanoags, okay. Metacom, the leader of Wampanoags, Wampanoags, okay. The New Englanders called him King Philip, okay. Here, here is the key point. The Metacom, the leader of Wampanoags, W A M P A N O A G S, okay. Wam Wampanoas, okay, Wampanoas, the New England called him King Philip, okay, Metacom, the leader of Wampanoas, the lead New England, Englanders called him King Philip, here you can remember the Metacom, okay, had for years brooded over his tribe's fate. In 1671, he had been forced to accept a treaty of absolute submission to white authority in all land sales. Soon thereafter, there began gathering around him a movement of resistance to the whites. The moment of crisis was approaching, either the whites were going to expel and the Indians could recapture their pride and dignity with their erstwhile lands or utter defeat would have to be accepted. When in spring 1675, a praying Indian revealed the Wampanoag's plans. Okay, in 1675, a praying Indian revealed the Wampa Wampanoag's plans. He was put to death. Consequently, three Indians accused of the crime were hung under New England's laws, following a white man's trial. Now, a guerrilla campaign began against isolated New England villages and settlements. Military troops were raised to retaliate. The alarm went out through all New England and through the summer of that year an elusive Metacom joined by other tribes engaged in battle after battle. So guerrilla war was there. Okay, guerrilla war or guerrilla campaign was there. So it is a type of war. In time the whole New England frontier was in flames. The fighting continued for months on into the winter and then to the spring of 1676. By that time New England settlers were streaming back to towns nearer the coast and the upper Connecticut valley was ravaged. Towns less than 20 miles from Boston were under, under attack. Okay. Then contest of American literature but the conflict had become one of simple endurance and the Indians were running out of food and firepower. Fleeing westward, they ran into the barrier of the Iroquois, their traditional enemies. Okay, Iroquois, their traditional enemies, they fleeing westward. Okay, turning back to their ancestral lands, they again came under attack. In the summer of 1676, surrenders began. Leaders were executed or sold into slavery in the West Indies. 
in august 1676 mutakam was slain the first of the great indian wars was over but it had been a shocking holocaust Hol holocaust okay the first of the great indian wars was over but it had been a shocking holocaust easily among the most savage and costly of all such conflicts in american history the five tribes of the iroquois were differed were different from the other indians whom the colonist encountered okay the five tribes of the iroquois were different from the other indians whom the colonist encountered occupying the mohawk valley in new york their powerful confeder confederacy with its 10000 people terrified all other interior tribes they undertook widely ranging campaigns over vast distances sending other indians fleeing in terror before them and redistributing the whole interior pattern of tribal residents curiously enough when not at war they were extremely mellow and urban the iroquois based life within their confederacy on arrangements for individual freedom and government by consent of the governed that contrasted sharply with the situation in most european countries their principal chiefs were known as powerful reasoners wise and formidable men who relied on a clear and distinct set of ideas for guidance moved by some inexplicable genius they had been able to construct an enlightened and enduring confederacy in the midst of an indian world characterized by dissipation and disintegration common concerns of the confederated tribes were settled through representative interactive councils and not by not by the use of force okay the prime mover of this inspiring confederation was an extraordinary individual named hiwatha hiwatha it is the the prime mover of the inspiring confederation was an extraordinary individual inspired by another extraordinary individual named Diga, uh, digana vaza who had a transcendent vision of universal human bonding hiwatha and digana vada digana vida okay hiwatha attempted to unify the endemically conflicting iroquois tribes by moving back and forth from tribe to tribe trying to teach them to live peacefully with the rest of the tribes the government of iroquois confederacy was fashioned thereafter under the guidance of digana vida and hiwatha so these are two types of tribes ministers that is diganavada and hiwatha a completely civil confederacy it did not allow warriors to be representatives to the federal councils for they might tend to take war like stands each tribe had a given number of representatives who could be removed for wrong doing by their own tribes okay so each tribe had a given number of representatives to keep a eye watch okay who could be removed for wrong doing by their own tribes the capital of the iroquois leaked moved uh, moved about it was located near the present town of casinovia newark south of syracuse when white men came into contact with the confederacy the capital of the iroquois leaked moved about it was located near the present town of casinovia newark south of syracuse when white men came into contact with the confederacy in the relationship with white men the iroquois tried to play off the inimical french against the friendly british okay in their relationship with white men the iroquois tried to play off the inimical french against the friendly friendly british in order to cement their friendship with the british the iroquois became the middleman in the fur trade delivering to albany fur trade otherwise have gone to montreal okay for for trading delivering to albany what would otherwise have gone to montreal thus they ruled virtually uncontested over an empire of thousands of square miles from the atlantic to lake superior from canada to tennis river yet it was there a alliance between with the british that proved to be their undoing implicating them in the british defeat in the american war of independence thus ended a unique empire devoted to humanitarian ideas of liberty and fraternity conceived and executed by an indian people prior to the 
arrival of the whites and surviving even today in the traditions of the Iroquois who still live in Mohawk Valley. The black contest or the contest invisibilized. Okay. Here to the last part, the black contest or the contest invisibilized. Even as the Indians were encountering the onslaught of the white power, material as well as cultural, the white is the whites are were engaged in importing yet another ethnic group into America with the express purpose of exploiting them to erect their own structure of state and civil society. The African slave trade first began in 1500s, bringing workers to the Spanish empire and to the large Portuguese possession, Brazil. Indeed, Africans have always made up a large proportion of the Brazilian population than they ever have that of North America. It was common in large parts of the country for slaves to outnumber whites 3 to 1. Indeed, it could be stated without hyperbole that the influence of Africa upon Brazil was second only to that of Portugal. When the English founded their North American colonies in 1600s, people of African descent appeared within them almost as soon as whites. In a famous event in 1619, the first group of black slaves, possibly indentured servants, disembarked at Virginia. During the 1630s, the first colonial laws were enacted formally establishing the institution of slavery. The Virginians 1619 were in dire straits. Among them were the survivors from the winter of 1609 to 1610, the starving time when crazed for want of food. They roamed the woods for nuts and berries and dog of graves to eat the corpses of those unfortunate fellow colonists who died in batches still. All in all, they were reduced to 16 number. Okay. The Virginians needed labor to grow corn for subsistence and to grow tobacco for marketing. They had just figured out how to grow tobacco and in 1617 they sent off the first cargo to England earning a decent profit. They could not force the Indians to work for them. They were outnumbered and while with superior firearms they could massacre Indians, they could not capture them and kept them enslaved. The Indians were rough and tough and at home in these woods as the transplanted Englishmen were not. White servants had not yet been brought over in sufficient quantity. Besides, they did not come out of slavery and did not have to do more than the contract their labor for a few years to get their passes and a start in the land they had arrived at. Such laborers were kept at their work by making settlement difficult so they could not live as independent farmers or their terms of service were extended which was often done by various service devices or were kept poor. This produced a permanently turbulent, potentially explosive lower class. The alternative was the use of black cells to their credit. The Virginians actually did not create the institution of slavery. Black slaves were commonly available as a regular item of trade. Using slaves then means simply keeping them in condition once purchased and dispensing with the use of those troublesome white servants. Okay, two types of servants are there, the black servants and white servants and black servants are commonly available and they are regular item of trade. While the mint simply keeping in their condition once purchased and dispensing with the use of those troublesome white servants. Naturally, the English colonists start taking a major role in stimulating the enormous movement of people from Africa to America. Perhaps more people made this crushing impact than from Europe. A conservative estimate is that during the whole course of the slave trade, perhaps 15 million Africans were delivered alive from one end to one end of America to the other. The number who perished either in Africa during long slave journeys or on the infamous slave ships might approach that figure. Starvation and sickness in the slave ships shrinking holds took a frightful toll. The Africans also fought back against their captivity whenever and wherever they could in bloody battles with their captors. On other occasions, captives simply flung themselves en masse into the sea to drown. 
turning in the water to south derisively before disappearing from sight colonists intentionally imported male as well as female slaves so that the slaves had children whom the owners got free of charge between 1700 and 1750 virginia planters acquired about 45000 slaves but the black population actually increased during those years from perhaps 10000 to 1 lakh in such a situation profits could be excellent for a burgeoning labor supply main burgeoning sales of tobacco gradually slaves were employed in diversity of jobs as metal workers miners builders and like however their primary utilization continued to be in agriculture or plantations where gang labor and disciplined group endeavor were practiced so that is the auction of slaves were to be sold a cargo of 94 prime healthy negroes consisting of 39 men 15 boys 24 women and 16 girls just arrived in the brinkton dembia francis bear matter from sierra leone by david and john days okay here it is a letter step traders announced their sales in newspaper advertisements okay then slavery came to virginia in a big way when planters stopped buying the contracts of white servants by the end of 1600s possibly half of the virginia labor force consisted of slaves and the balance swing swung swiftly in the direction thereafter the inflow of white indentured servants from england into virginia dwindled away okay the inflow of white indentured servants from england to virginia dwindled away which meant that later inflow of white freed men into virginia life also subsided subsided now the threat of an angry laboring class of truculent white men truculent white men was somewhat mitigated labor became more or less attached to the skin color all white men increasingly had something to say for the rich or poor their status as free whites above enslaved blacks this made for a powerful bond between white people no less than the europeans the black slaves brought from africa varied widely in skin color appearance stature and culture they came from ancient societies with highly devoted states some of them so powerful that except for tiny trading post here and there europeans made no attempt to conquer the vast interior of africa for africans did not leave their cultural heritage behind when they were forced into slavery this unique painting done in 1775 or after so slaves passing their few hours of leisure on sunday or holiday with a dance several identifiably african elements appear in the picture the drum and banjo like instrument are both of african origin as are the scraps scarfs and cane used in the tribal dance the blue and white bandanas worn by two of the women are similar to yoruba cloth from west africa abby aldrick rockefeller folkart collection williamsburg virginia then hundred of years after the slave trade began okay hundred of years after the slave trade began okay hundred of the years after the slave trade began okay so here it is hundred of the years after the slave trade began slave trade began slave seekers traded with the africans arriving of the coastline and sending in boats they themselves did not trek into the interior and capture slaves in the great african principalities as in contemporary late medieval europe slavery was widespread okay african principalities slavery as in contemporary late medieval europe slavery was widespread in europe africa it was simply an extreme form of servantship applied to captured men and women from outside the nation or faith christians in europe had given up enslaving other christians but infid- infidels did not fall within the ambit of human consideration the slave in africa however was treated more like a human being who could marry keep his family together okay and progress out of slavery only in america and particularly in the english colonies 
did the idea evolve of the slave as a sub human kind of chattel to be bought and sold like a piece of real estate in their homelands the african had developed a culture that was not only rich but also intricate the village unit had its guild lever class which was frequently divided into guilds of potters weavers wood carvers wood carvers and metal workers agriculture was a highly organized communal undertaking since the land belonged to the entire village in the interior regions the african economy was largely pastoral centering on the raising of goat sheep and cattle cattle great aggregations of interrelated people constituted kinship networks presided over a over by a patriarch this person in consultation with elders served as a judge administrator treasurer and diplomat african society was embedded in a rich cultural life in which sophisticated sculpturing sculpturing in bronze wood and ivory played an important part in religious observance complex musical composition involving instruments such as the violin guitar flute zither harp and xylophone enlivened every aspect of life dancing likewise uh, likewise was intimately interwoven with daily life african literature like the literature of the indians of america was basically oral and like indian american literature was rich in scientific information history and poetic nuances for a while the slave was thought of as an indentured servant similar in status to what different from an english person laboring in the fields under contract certainly there appeared to have been free blacks in virginia and maryland not long after use of slaves began this was because english law in the 17th century did not recognize slavery and there was a considerable period during which the legal status of slaves in the mainland colonies was in question the uncertainty regarding the black person's position as a slave however had been settled long before 1700 enslaved men and women were clearly owned for life as were their children they are not yet fully depressed into the legal condition of a mere piece of property with no democratic or personal right but their status was not far away eventually american slavery became one of the most absolute forms of enslavement known to history chattel slavery where marriages were not recognized in law where slaves had virtually no authority other than their master existed only in english speaking colonies okay there in india to as you know as custom of bonded labor or life existed under the jamitars or landlords okay these are called chattel slavery certain revolutionary alterations in the english economy over the 17th century had allowed for the release of the entrepreneur from any government controls and consequently granted owners of property whether in form of land or goods or chattel slaves the liberty to handle their property entirely as they desired that this vastly energized the english economy is without question but the progress was questionable when looked at to the lens of social and moral values the planters of virginia of the other southern colonies of north america inherited this economic system they were free to treat their chattel absolutely according to their whims and fancies the state and the several churches were important in the matter of regulating the management of slaves by their masters because financially they were wholly dependent upon their white patrons therefore the peculiar institution of slavery in the english colonies thrived very much under under lesses fares fairy conditions then come to the poor white contest or the contest overshadowed the use of black as slaves in some measures spared whites from coming to terms with the class schisms schisms within their own society but the schisms were by no means eliminated together in 1676 70 years after virginia was founded the colony faced a rebellion of white frontier frontiersmen supported by servants and slaves a rebellion so intense that the governor had to flee the burning capital of jamestown and england decided to send a thousand soldiers across the atlantic hoping to restore order among the 40000 colonists this was bacon's rebellion bacon's rebellion began with conflict over how to deal with indians who on the western frontier constantly threatened those whites who had gone to settle 
thereafter having been denied lucrative land grants around Jamestown. Violence had escal escalated, escalated on the frontier before the rebellion. Okay, violence had escalated on the frontier before the rebellion. Some dog Indians took a few hogs to redress the debt, and the whites retrieving the hogs murdered two Indians. Few hogs to redress the debt, and the whites retrieving the hogs murdered two Indians. The Doaks then took out a war party to kill a white herdsman, after which a white military company killed 24 Indians. This led to a series of Indian raids with the Indians outnumbered turning to guerrilla warfare. Again guerrilla warfare was there, the killed 24 Indians. The government at Jamestown declared war on Indians but proposed to exempt those Indians who cooperated. This seemed to an anger of frontiers people who wanted total war but also resented the high taxes assessed to pay for the war. Times were had in 1676, it was a dry summer running ruining the corn crop which was needed for food and tobacco crop needed for foreign exchange. The great mass of people lived in severe econo economic straits. Governor Berkeley, Berkeley in his 70s tried of, tried of holding office wrote wearily about this situation. How miserable that man is that governor governs a people where six parts of uh, seven at least are poor, indebted, discontented and armed. His press six parts of seven suggests the existence of an upper class not so poor. In fact, there was such a class already developed in Virginia. That is six parts of seven means suggests existence of an upper class. Here it is the main key point. Six parts of seven means suggests the existence of upper class. Okay, that is the in Beckley, Governor Beckley time, Berkeley time. In fact, there was such a class already developed in Virginia. Nathaniel Bacon, the leader of Bacon's rebellion himself came from this class, had a good bit of land and was probably less enthused about redressing class grievances than about killing Indians. But as historian Howard Jean has analyzed, he became a symbol of class resentment against the Virginia establishment, making it through the mandate of an election to the Legislative Assembly of Virginia. When Bacon insisted on organizing armed detachments to fight the Indians outside official control, Berkeley proclaimed, proclaimed him a rebel and had him captured. Whereupon 2,000 Virginians marched into Jamestown to support him. Berkeley let Bacon go in return for an apology, but Bacon went off, gathered his militia and began raiding the Indians. Bacon died soon after of natural causes and the rebellion fizzled, fizz, fizzled out. Okay? Bacon died soon after natural causes and the rebellion fizzled out. A task force of 1000 soldiers sent from England managed to subdue the rebel garrisons comprising freemen, servants and slaves by a combination of gul and force. At the end of the operation, 23 rebel leaders were hanged. It was a complex chain of operation in Virginia. The Indians were plundered by white frontiersmen who were piloted by the Jamestown elite and the whole colony was being exploited by England which bought the colonist tobacco at prices it dictated and made 1 lakh pounds a year for the king. For the masses of Virginia, however, the governor represented the most visible source of their exploitation and as Richard Lee, a member of governor's council, noted their support of Bacon in his conflict with the governor was prompted by hopes of leveling. Okay. So who was prompted by hopes of leveling? That is Richard Lee, a member of governor's council. Here it is a Richard Lee, a member of governor's council, okay, noted their support of Bacon in this complete of the governors are prompted by hopes of leveling. Then leveling, leveling meant equalizing the wealth, okay, Richard Lee questioned about leveling means equalizing the wealth. Leveling was to be behind countless action of poor whites against the rich in all the English colonies in the century and a half before the revolution. The people who joined Bacon's rebellion were part of large underclass of miserably poor whites who came into the North America colonies from the European cities whose governments were anxious to be rid of them. 
In England, the development of commerce and capitalism in 1500 days and 1600 days, the enclosing of land for the production of wool filled the cities and, vagar, uh, and the vagrant poor and from the reign of Elizabeth on, laws were passed to punish them, imprison them in workhouses or exile them. In the 1600 days and 1700 days, by forced exile, by lures, promises, force and by their urgent need to escape the living conditions of the home country, poor people wanting to go to America become commodities of profit for merchants, ship captains and eventually their masters in America. Ebert Smith, in his study of indentured servitude, colonist in bondage, okay, colonist in bondage written by Ebert Smith. Here it is the main key point, Ebert Smith is the colonist in bondage, okay. From the complex pattern of forces producing emigration to the American colonies stands out clearly as most powerful in causing the movement of servants. This was the pecuniary, pecuniary profit to be made by shipping them. Indentured servants were brought and sold like slaves. Servants had few rights, could not marry without permission and could be separated from their families. Beatings and whippings of servants was common. Servant women were, rap were raped. Finding their situation intolerable and rebellion impractical in an increasingly organized society. Servants reacted in individual ways. Sometimes they were just lazy and disobedient. Sometimes they, they hit out physically at their masters. Okay? Many sought to annul their bondage through escape and a few went on strike. But those poor whites in America who were not servants did not have an easy time either. It is quite clear that class lines hardened through the colonial period and the distinction between rich and poor became sharper. While the deprived majority scrounged around for a livelihood, scrounged around for a livelihood, the privileged minority within the nascent cities such as Boston, New York, Philadelphia and Charleston monopolized the wealth and resources of an expanding economy. Everywhere the poor were struggling to stay alive simply to maintain themselves at a subsistence level of existence. All the cities built poor houses in the 1730s not just for old people, orphans, widows and crippled, but for new immigrants who are veterans and unemployed. In New York at mid-century, the city arm house built for 100 homeless was housing over 400. A Philadelphia, a Philadelphia citizen wrote in 1748, it is remarkable what an increase, increase of number of beggars there is about this town this winter. In 1757, Boston officials spoke of a great number of poor who can scarcely procure from day-to-day -day daily bread for themselves and their families. The colonies, it seems, were societies of contending classes, a fact obscured by the emphasis in traditional histories on the external struggle against England, the unity of colonists in the American Revolution. The country, therefore, was not born free, but born native and alien, slave and free, servant and master, poor and rich. Okay? The country, there, therefore, was not born free, but born native and alien, slave and free, servant and master, poor and rich. As a result, the political authorities were opposed frequently, vociferously and sometimes violently, according to sociologist Gary Nash. Outbreaks of disorder punctuated the last quarter of the 17th century, toppling established governments in Massachusetts, New York, Maryland, Virginia and North Carolina. With the existing problem of Indian hostility and the increasing danger of slave revolts, the emerging problem of the disaffection among poor white servants as well as otherwise troubled the colonial elite. As the colonies passed their 100th year and went into the middle of the 1700s, as the gap between rich and poor widened as violence and the threat of violence escalated, the problem of control become, became serious. Okay, Here it is the condition of, at that time. So what if their different despised groups, the Indians, the slaves, the poor whites should combine? Bacon's rebellion was an especially fearsome event in the opinion of the rulers, rulers of Virginia because in it white servants and black slaves, slaves joined forces. The final surrender was by 400 English and Negroes in arms at one garrison and 300 freemen and African and English bond servants in another garrison. Okay, 400 English and Negroes in arms and 300 freemen and freemen and African and English born. 
okay so there is the in another garrison is the virginia virginia war okay the naval commander who subdued to for the 400 road most of them i persuaded i go into their homes which accordingly they did except about 80 negroes and 20 english which would not deliver their arms a significant factor which came in the way of such civilian unity on a wider scale was the development by the end of the third quarter of the 18th century of a white middle class from the new cities or independent farmers and money trades people who given some rewards for making common cause with merchants and planters would be a solid buffer against poor white slaves and indians this middle class american might be invited to join a new elite by on the on, on the one hand being assured protection against competition from members of other races and on the other hand being seduced with aspiration of emulating the established rich the pennsylvania journal wrote in typical piece in 1756 the people of this province are generally of the middling sort and at present pretty much upon a level they were chiefly industrious farmers artificers or men in trade they enjoy and are fond of freedom and the meanest among them thinks he has a right to civility from the greatest indeed there was already a substantial middle class fitting that description not only in pennsylvania but in most uh, most other states of america but to call up them the people as did pennsylvania journal was to omit the displaced indians the blacks the black slaves and the desperate poor whites the contest of the ignored groups were hardly ever considered in dominant accounts of the Af american literature canon although it was through the very process of their marginalization that the canonical taste and the contest of american literature as we have known them over decades established themselves as such then let us sum up in this unit i have tried to account for some other contest of american literature which is uh, which the puritan contest till recently taken as the only contest of the literature managed to sideline and even suppress these include the quaker contest the indian contest the black contest the poor white contest all of which in their very marginalization made possible the projection exclusively of puritan contest of american literature here it is the question in what ways were the early quakers in america similar to yet different from the early puritans in america already i have discussed give an account of how the first white settlers in america ensured that neither the culture of indians nor the culture of the blacks would supersede or even survive their own how did the white elite in the 80 english colonies of north america during the 17th and 18th centuries prevent a united assault against themselves by the poor whites the slaves of the indians okay so please go through the chapter once again and make down the points and subsequently we will go for next video keep watching the video till end then here it is the suggested reading okay I will stop here in next video I will go to cover unit 5 also okay thank you.